This is a production of Cornell University. Okay. It is indeed a pleasure and privilege to be back at Cornell University. As Tracy mentioned, I've been here a couple of times. And um, I have to apologize up front because what I'm going to attempt to do in two hours is squeeze a day long presentation into two hours. Um, and so some of the things that I had the opportunity to share in previous visits, I want to make sure you get a sample of. So let's get right into it. I'm going to be rushed, and again, I apologize for that. How many of you participated in previous institutes? Anyone? OK, so a couple of returns. Good to see you. So what we want to do in the next two hours is think about how we can improve our teaching in increasingly diverse learning environments, right? As many of you have talked about already, our students are looking different today than they were 10 years ago. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I want to put a different spin on it. It's the same question, just asked a different way. How can we create learning environments that respect and care for the souls of our students? So same question, asked in a different way. I think they're both related. I have some assumptions about teaching and learning, about pedagogy, about race, and I want to be transparent about those up front before we get started in our conversation. The first is a really big one for me, and that is that race matters, okay? that identity matters. How you identify yourself and how others identify you has implications for how we engage in teaching and learning collectively. And context matters. This is Cornell. I would guess that Cornell has a particular culture, particular feel as a university. And then within different parts of that university, that plays out differently. I've had the opportunity to spend time at Connecticut College Wesleyan University, Princeton, Harvard, MIT, UMass Boston, and most recently for the last eight years at the University of Denver. And all of those institutions have a different feel, a different culture. There's some similarities, but how diversity plays out in that specific context is in some ways unique to that institutional setting and location. And I would guess that how diversity plays out here is unique to this institution. This is a hard one. Any individual perception is reality. What I mean by that is sometimes we have a tendency to want to dismiss other people's perceptions of reality. That because they believe they feel a certain way, or because they perceive certain interactions in a certain way, that we can critique, challenge, question, and determine that that's not real. And in some ways, it allows us to not be accountable for the perceptions that our students have in our classrooms about us and what we do. So I want to challenge that notion. Related to that is this notion that good intentions produce positive or progressive results. I believe all of you have good intentions that you're here because you want to learn. You're here because you've been involved in a conversation about these issues. Some are beginning brand new. Some of, of you have been living these um, ideas and concepts for a long time. Right? And you want to improve. I'm going to talk about inclusive teaching, inclusive excellence. And the one thing I, I know from experience and from my engagement with professors all over the country is that it's not easy to do. It's a lot easier to come to class and assume that all of our students are the same. To teach as if all our students are the same doesn't require the same investment 
as teaching if all of our students are different. And so I understand why sometimes we want to approach teaching that way. It's a lot easier. But in promoting inclusive classrooms requires self-awareness. I'm going to try to get you to engage in some of that today. I'm going to ask you to trust me. <laughs> Courage. Courage in the sense that sometimes stepping out of our comfort zone makes us feel vulnerable. And I believe that feeling vulnerable actually is an important part of teaching. It's sort of cont a contradiction to what we've been taught, right? We've been taught to have all the answers. Um, sometimes stepping back and stepping away from that can release um, some of the pressure that comes with that. And continuous commitment that we have to stay engaged with these issues and not fall back on the idea that we can take what we did last year and come to class this year and do the same thing. So I usually have this near the bottom because then people will say, well, why are you here? Right? But this idea that experts and toolkits are impractical, there is no one size fits all. What I mean by that is I'm going to offer some perspectives today. And I don't expect anyone to go out and, and try to put into practice what we've talked about here without tailoring it to your own specific way of teaching and learning. That the 10 steps to an inclusive classroom will look different for each of you because of who you are. And who you are, again, matters as it relates to the classrooms that you encounter. So I'm offering some perspectives. It is not the truth about inclusive teaching. And what I want to encourage you all to do is to come up with your own sort of truths about it. Two hours, again, we will raise more questions than answers, and that's okay because what I want to do is get you thinking about how you teach and the choices you make in relationship to teaching. And you will answer those questions sometime in the future. And then the last assumption is, again, that we can always do better. That even though I've spent a lot of time thinking about race and creating inclusive classrooms. I learn something new every time I go into the classroom. And I learn something new every time I engage with a new audience. And so um, that's the thing that I enjoy the most, being able to um, add to the repertoire of things we're thinking about. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're having a problem with the mic, and we've actually got you another one. Oh. Or we should have another one right now. Okay. I don't know if it's rubbing or interfering, but that's, sorry to interrupt, but I'm sure other folks could hear that. Yeah. I'm not sure why I had two mics in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A lot of my thoughts about creating inclusive classrooms have evolved over time. So in 2003, I wrote this uh, sort of final chapter in the Race and Higher Ed book about the search for a more inclusive pedagogy. And then a few years later, the American Association of Colleges and Universities came out with a sort of four-part series on inclusive excellence, which has helped me even think about teaching uh, creating inclusive classrooms even more. I'm just going to do a quick overview. I encourage you to get the full series. You can go to AACNU's website and download them. Um, and they talk about inclusive excellence as this new framework for thinking about merging inclusion and excellence together. That historically what we've done is moved, to, we've sort of separated diversity and excellence and they are arguing that we need to move those two together. So that's the short version of that. 
I talk about the purposeful embodiment of inclusive practices towards multiple social identity groups. Simply as saying that we have students sitting in our classrooms who have a broad range of lived experiences that inform how they engage in learning, and we need to be able to account for that, right? It also requires that we focus on students as holistic individuals. Sometimes we are um, intentionally focused on the mind, and we don't take into consideration how other aspects of what makes them who they are inform their experiences in our institutions. So this is the being attentive to students as whole human beings. Okay? Some of you may be familiar with the, the notion that sometimes we're asked to check aspects of our identity at the door when we enter the learning space. This is suggesting that no, we need students and faculty to enter as whole. Development and utilization of educational resources to enhance student learning. That's, for example, participating in things like this. But also talking about the rich resources that students bring to the classroom. Their lived experiences are a powerful opportunity to help students understand complicated concepts and ideas and problems. Cultural differences diverse learners bring to the educational experiences and how those cultural differences enhance the teaching and learning environment. So again, this notion that students bring valuable assets with them. In order to extract the benefits or the assets that students bring with them, we have to create inclusive classrooms, right? That allow for all of our students to engage in diversity in pursuit of individual and collaborative learning. And establishes an environment that challenges each student to achieve academically at the highest levels. Again, this notion that in order to, to be excellent, we need to compromise diversity. In order to have diversity, we have to compromise excellence. Saying we can no longer do that. We have to bring the two together, hold students to the highest standards in the pursuit of inclusive excellence. <clears throat> Why should we do this? We've already talked about the disconnect between, edu between educational excellence and diversity. Right? Demographic shifts on campus. Haven't looked at the numbers here at Cornell recently, but I can guess that they're different than they were 10 years ago. Nationally, we're seeing a significant increase in the college-going population where white students in particular are becoming the minority. Okay? So higher ed institutions have to figure out how they're going to educate this increasingly diverse cohort of students. Changing profile of the workforce also related to this is how do we prepare our students to go out and be successful leaders and managers in an increasingly diverse workforce. Shifting social policies and laws. We heard a conversation earlier where a question around affirmative action came up and whether or not higher ed institutions will be able to continue to use, um, to be affirmative in their inclusion of race in decisions, right? And some of us are patiently or anxiously awaiting uh, the Texas decision. We also know that there are still a range of gaps, right? Achievement gaps, access gaps, resource gaps, health gaps, employment gaps, income gaps. And in some cases, they're not closing, they're expanding, right? There's a belief that higher education, in theory, should have the ability to do something about that. Institutional history and legacy. I think we're moving further and further away from this 
But I still end up sometimes at institutions where the current students talk about how their grandparents couldn't attend <coughs> that institution. Okay. So there's still this notion that some institutions are accessible to some communities, not all communities. Our biggest challenge at the University of Denver is that there's a perception that it's a school for rich white kids. And while some of that perception is reality, the numbers suggest that we've made some, some progress in that. So how do we change that perception or make it more accurate in terms of understanding that what this institution was 25 years ago is not what it is today? Most importantly, I would argue that why we do this is because it matters, that there's a value from inclusive teaching. And here are just some of them that the research has shown us. It improves academic outcomes, educational aspirations, self-confidence, critical thinking, and problem-solving abilities. That when we're able to create inclusive learning environments, students are able to achieve some of these outcomes. Diversity outcomes enhances perspectives and experiences, improves cultural awareness, fosters creativity and innovation. Simple example is the more diverse perspectives you have addressing a particular problem, the more likely you're going to find a range of innovation, innovative sort of solutions and ideas to that problem. Right? Civic outcomes, higher levels of civic engagement, creates informed citizens, strengthens commitment to equity and justice. So just some of the educational benefits from creating inclusive classrooms and engaging in, in inclusive teaching. So that's the crash course overview related to inclusive teaching. Based on that, I want you to take a few minutes just to think about your own teaching. And I want you to write down a few answers related to what challenges, concerns, or barriers do you have related to teaching a diverse student population and creating an inclusive classroom? What challenges, concerns, or barriers do you have related to teaching a diverse student population and creating an inclusive classroom? Take a few minutes just to write down a couple of ideas. Take a couple of minutes, or a couple of seconds rather, to finish up that thought that you're working on. And I should have warned you that I'm going to ask you to talk to each other. Um, 
Sometimes people like to know that in advance. So just turn to the person you're next to and share a couple of things you talked, you wrote about. A couple of questions, concerns that came up for you. So what challenges, concerns, barriers did you come up with? Who wants to share one? Yes. Acknowledging diverse and particularly visually diverse students without making them feel like they're sticking out. Bell Hooks calls this the sort of native informant, right? How do we take advantage of the rich diversity that exists in our classes without further marginalizing them in that process, right? Yeah, challenge. What else? Yes? I was struck by your, the word gaps and the whole idea of gaps. And um, I, I teach CU art, and I have students that we support students to come here with all sorts of scholarships. But all of a sudden, I'm realizing this student over here is only working with found materials to do somebody else's trash. Right? We don't support them in materials so that we have no way to provide the students we brought here that need probably some assistance with materials for their studio art pieces. And it's expensive. Mm -hmm. So we should have a system in which the students can apply for and automatically get the money they need for the supplies they need. But it doesn't So automatically those inequality. Pardon? Yeah. Automatically those inequality. Absolutely. You want to do something, right? Right. I mean, what I do is I'll say materials left by other students, and when I notice this is happening, I just say, here's the math board, here's this, right. you know, and, or I buy it myself. There are certain practices, behaviors, things that we do, rituals that some students have access to and others don't by way of their, their backgrounds, right? Um, in, in sociology, um, a lot of times, in teaching a sociology class, um, it, I'll notice that there are students, especially international students or students from other um, backgrounds or cultures who are really hesitant to speak up in discussions because it's completely different than their than the pedagogical styles that they had at home. And especially if I'm doing a, you know, TA section and we're supposed to have discussions. So I, you know, I try to at some point acknowledge also because it's a sociology class, right, we can talk about, you know, different uh, influences on people. Um, and I, I'll mention usually at some point in the class that I often encounter this. You know, I'll talk about it kind of abstractly and say, you know, a lot of times in other cultures, people don't have these kind of discussions. So, it, you know, pe when people come here, it's, it's an unusual experience. And I will often see people nodding. Yeah. Um, but um, not totally sure how to, you know, I, I have people talk in small groups, et cetera. I don't want to go on, but that's yeah. one thing that comes up a lot. Yeah. Having them talk in small groups is a great, great way to give people an opportunity to practice, right? That's why I had you pair up. Actually, I had you write first, so you have a conversation with yourself. Then you're having a conversation with someone else. And hopefully, you're ready to engage and share your ideas in a larger space. We have, whether we want to admit it or not, rules of engagement in our classroom, ways in which we are supposed to <coughs> engage in learning that we expect our students to. And some students come to our classrooms very familiar with those rules. 
and are comfortable engaging according to those rules. And sometimes look down on other students when they don't follow those rules. One of the things, and again, this will vary by discipline. I teach education, which is very undisciplinary. There's this tension that students sometimes struggle for the space. So which rules are going to going to own the space for that moment. Where students, some students want to stick exclusively to the text. I don't want to talk about anything other than what we read. And other students want to talk about how the readings related to their own experiences. Okay? And so you get this, what I call swing of the pendulum. We're in a lived experience discourse. And then someone pulls it back to the text discourse. And my goal, as I see it, is to get them to meet somewhere in the middle, to balance that out. Or students are sometimes uncomfortable with emotion in the classroom. And some students are much more comfortable with their emotions. How do we balance that? So what are the rules of engagement in your class, and how do we Expand it so that more people can participate and feel comfortable participating in. Other concerns? Yes? I noticed there's this blocking where people kind of self assign themselves into blocks. So you look at the classroom and you basically sort of by um, appearances. Mm -hmm. And it's not just um, racial background, but sometimes it's also clothing style. So they're, they're all blocked there and then they interact with each other and they form study groups with each other and not that's often not the best strategy in order to have diverse experiences in class. And so um, at the other hand, it's, you know, how do you break it up without saying? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you require group participation, whether it's group projects, um, learning teams? Just raise your hand. So most of you, how do you decide who's in a group? Random numbers. Random numbers. How many of you use random numbers? Sometimes. I don't have the answer for this one. I go back and forth. Random numbers seem fair because then we're not accountable for how the groups end up. But I have numerous experiences where I was the one student of color in that group. And I look across the room, and in that group over there, there are three students of color in that group. Which group do you think I would rather be in? But just by chance, I'm in the group by myself. And I'm supposed to trust that because it was random, it's fair. Now, if you let students choose their groups, what happens? I don't have the answer to this one. My suggestion would be to use different strategies. Sometimes I do want to be surrounded by people I can identify with socially, culturally, racially. And sometimes I do want to engage diverse perspectives and experiences. In an ideal world, I would have the opportunity to, to do both in the classroom. That's an ideal world. I don't have an answer to that one. Random group seems to work, again, because then we're not accountable. But there are inequitable experiences across those groups based on how the numbers play out. So if I'm the lone student of color in the group, who's going to get asked the questions about my experience? Yes. Well, one of the things I've done that I think has worked well is I asked students to self-identify as to what expertise they have on something. So can you read a foreign language? Do you know a lot about hydraulic engineering? Do you know a lot about topography of X? And then I try to create groups that draw upon, you know, create a group, each group that has these different expertise. And it's nice because it empowers them to say, okay, I'm really good at this. Maybe you all didn't know that, but I can read, you know, fluids in Spanish or Chinese or whatever. And then 
so it involves me having to sit down and then sort of take <coughs> it as a group. So it's somewhat random, but it's not, and they're not choosing their own groups, and it depends on the assignment. The more information we have about our students, the better we informed we are about decisions we make. Absolutely. Um, at a Stephen Brookfield workshop, of a, it was two years ago this uh -huh. May, he introduced a participation rubric, which if I had to pick one single tool that has that worked. changed my, t it's amazing. And, and he suggests making it very clear what you mean by participation, defining it, and then his rubric that I've used as a springboard, he says, um, you know, you don't have assigned seats. You're expected to move around the room, engage with other students. You're going to be, we, I'd rather that you call attention to someone else's brilliant remark than be making your own. And, you know, when you spell it out like that, it, it's pretty extraordinary. It puts it in there. It, it asks them to be the ones engaging with one another. And, because our Cornell students are so eager to do, you know, to do what they're <laughs> expected. I mean, they, they, they have a rubric that defines their participation. It, it really, really has worked beautifully. Great resource. Great resource. What's that called again? It's just, if you were to Google Stephen Brookfield participation rubric, I'm sure mm -hmm. it would pop up. And then you can adapt it to your own use. Couple more. Yes. I'm challenged by large classes where I look out on a sea of faces and don't know the individuals. And I contrast that with a very small class where I get to know an individual and I find myself tailoring uh, my advising to that individual's strengths and trying to really bring out the, what they're particularly interested in. But in the big group, I don't know them. And I so I'm sort of at a loss of how to get better informed about that. Real challenge. <clears throat> this case size matters, right? The size of the class. I don't think it's impossible, though. And I'm sure some of you have strategies that you <coughs> use to take large classes and make them smaller. To quickly, efficiently figure out ways to learn at least one thing about a student. Whether it's um, asking students to submit cards about why they were in this class, why they chose to take it. <laughs> or asking students to have name cards or name plates so that if you do open up a large classroom to, for discussion, you can identify a person by, by name. Or creating opportunities for students to talk to each other in triads or pairs or smaller groups within the large class context. Again, it's a challenge, a real <coughs> challenge, one that requires more creativity and innovation. And I would encourage you to share those ideas that you use uh, to break down large classes. Technology is another way, right, to do that. Yes? Writing. Writing. Helping, helping students write better. Too many classes we assume that, you know, somebody else deals with writing and we deal with content. Yeah. It's a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> there was a wonderful interview with Sonia Sotomayor in three parts on NPR the other day. Yeah. She talks about getting a first C plus in college. Yeah. And she said that she didn't mind being told that the analytical structure was a problem. What she minded was when this professor then told her you write incomplete sentences and she realized she didn't know how to write another sentence. So it was an astonishing interview. Hmm. Earlier, I heard the, um, the conversation come up in terms of how some of our students arrive with, and this is my interpretation of it, different levels of preparation. Right? And so how do you teach the students who have different levels of preparation? Uh, writing is one where that, that 
comes up a lot, right? And then academic writing in particular, right, has a certain set of rules and, and, and uh, things that we are supposed to follow. And the question is always, so who's responsible for that? I get the, the sort of discourse around students being underprepared, but I also feel like sometimes that lets us off the hook. And it says, well, that's not my problem. The admissions office made this decision. And now we have to be accountable for it. And I feel like. There's a process, and there is, you know, there are very few completely perfect processes, but this one seems to allow you to get a group of students every year. And we assume that these students were admitted because they have something uh, interesting about them. And, and so I'd like to shift that balance a little bit to say, yeah, there are these different levels of preparation, but we have an expectation to get the best out of all of our students. Right? And so, um, in my interactions with students, they value those instructors who took the time to show them where their areas for improvement were. Are how they can get to your expectations. Clearly, there are some times where this just isn't going to work out. But in most cases, when students find that someone is invested in their learning, someone is taking the time to support them, they can reach the levels. They can surpass the levels that we have. And so what's structurally, what are the resources available to help students improve their writing? Right? And how do we not let students pass because they just didn't learn how to write their way? Again, it's easier to let them pass than it is to take the time to help them succeed. A couple more challenges, yes. Um, one of the challenges that I face is I teach art history and specifically Latin American art. And so sometimes a lot of the material is very kind of straightforward. We're doing visual analysis. But a lot of times, by necessity, we talk about very sensitive subjects like colonialism, racism, ethnicity. And I start to notice a very clear divide in the classrooms. And a lot of times, particularly white students who are once very vocal, start to get very quiet and I notice tensions that arise and microaggressions that start to come up where students start to feel resentful or uncomfortable talking about these issues and it will manifest itself in very insidious ways, you know, rolling the eyes or sometimes students will just become very silent or make faces. Um, and I've just noticed that it really sort of changes the balance of the, the classroom in, in uncomfortable ways. and the people who maybe should be talking or not, and I just, it's been a real challenge in terms of getting students to all participate equally and not feel sort of a sense of, of, of um, anger or resentment when these issues come into play or taking it personally. Yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of interesting dynamics that can play out in courses like that. I remember teaching a course recently where 80% of the students were students of color. And um, I'll come back to that. Remind me to come back to that. But there's something about, OK, this is our space now. And we're going to control it. And this is a unique opportunity. We don't have this experience often. Or the reverse, where students are like, even good intentions, students with good intentions. Um, I know that. I speak a lot, so in this particular issue, I'm going to let my colleagues handle it, right? So they withdraw. Uh, again, back to the sociology, I don't want to talk too much about this year. Like, one of the things I do, because we do talk about inequalities a lot, and we talk about colonialism and racism, et cetera, 
And I, and in these sections, especially the one-on-one -on -one sections where people are really uncomfortable um, and it, it, there are different things happening in different people, I, I, one of the things I do is I acknowledge, you know, this is uncomfortable and these are such, a, you know, this affects all of us and um, nobody's a bad guy here. We're all in the present moment. We're talking about um, larger forces in history and we're gonna fumble through it. I mean, I, I don't think that's perfect, but I acknowledge that it's hard. Yeah, it is. And I often say if you get to class and you haven't, and the class has started, and you haven't thought about this idea of the fact that you have these really um, deep, controversial topics, it's too late that the preparation that needs to happen ahead of time for students to be able to engage in these types of conversations. Um, I spend the first day really around building a community of learners that most of my courses deal with, with topics related to race. And, and so I know that if I can't create a community of learners, it's going to be a very difficult space. And so I'm sorry to didn't mean to interrupt. But uh, just completing on the following on the same trend, uh, I think sometimes I have the opposite problem uh, of what Ananda described, because also teaching this kind of uh, issues that relate to race and racism uh, uh, within the Brazilian context, in my case, um, I see that uh, different students in the class, because of their different uh, cultural or racial backgrounds, must be having very different reactions, but they just don't surface. And in this course, it's one of the things that I always try to do in relation to all subjects, is try to, to, to let this uh, Brazilian content make them reflect on their own situation here in the present. And I would like to do this with those matters too. But I feel uh, very uh, cautious, we were talking about this, in terms of like just and, uh, uh, avoiding to like just uh, assume uh, what this or that student is thinking because of the because they look different, right? Because right, yeah. right. if there is an African American student in the class, uh, how is she or he going to be thinking about uh, <coughs> when I talk about racism in Brazil, especially uh, color-based racism? Yeah. And but I don't want to like say oh what do you think of that's right. so it's <laughs> how to act on it in a positive way but without uh, creating uh, yeah being inappropriate. So um, I have a story of a student who very popular professor at Harvard and the student. The faculty member said to the student, um, I'm expecting you to talk about this issue in class tomorrow. <laughs> and the student in the interview with me thought about it, reflected on it, really, really respected the professor, and chose not to show up to class. <laughs> right. The student didn't want to be spotlighted around that particular issue at that particular time in the class. It's a faculty member of color asking another student of color to engage in a certain way. That made that student uncomfortable because of how her colleagues might perceive her interaction with that professor how her colleagues might perceive her. Uh, great intentions. Knew that the student had something valuable to say about this particular issue. But how he t attempted to get that didn't work for the student. Uh, that makes me uh, want to ask you for a comment on some uh, a suggestion that you often hear, which is going in the other direction and equalizing this. and telling all the students in a big class that uh, they will be randomly picked out uh, each class to say something about the readings of and that 
equalizes uh, it. it uh, some students feel terrorized. Uh, but I actually had a long chat with a student uh, who had been subjected, subjected to this, and she said that in the end she loved this because it made her actually read the readings. Imagine that. You sit in the back yeah. and, and uh, they actually get left out of it. And so she was, was rejoicing, actually, that she had been subjected to in the law school, which is where they often get yeah. here. But yeah. what about that? I mean, uh, the people who suggest this to me, they will do it in the spirit of uh, equality, the same for all, no matter you know where you're coming from. Uh, everybody's in this together. So I'm curious now that yeah. you mentioned your example. What you yeah. um, I believe the extent to which we can tra be transparent about our expectations up front, uh, we're okay. Right? So if we say at the beginning of class that we expect all of our students to participate, and at some point I'm going to expect to hear your voice in this classroom, they know that that's an expectation. Now, how we prepare students to do that, again, is important. And I think giving students opportunities to practice their ideas in small spaces in writing before forcing them to engage in a larger environment always helps. It always, it's not going to completely reduce anxiety around that. I was surprised to learn that some students, particularly students of color, appreciated the Socratic method. And some of the reaction to that was because at that particular moment, they were being, or at least felt like they were being treated as a valuable contributor to the learning environment, that what they had to say in that particular moment mattered. And it was more about how it was done that mattered. Couple more, yes. It's interesting your slide. So I teach statistics, so I'm in the upper class and graduates. And so your slide says, "What barriers do you have related to teaching a diversity population? You lack." Of <laughs> <laughs> this is the famous pipeline issue in the STEM field, right? right. It's not getting better. Right. In, in computer science, the gender balance is getting worse. So perhaps you could comment on getting people through the filters. Yeah. Well. Actually, I'm not going to try to address the, the access issue because <laughs> uh, that would take us uh, uh, the rest of the conference to, to try to tackle and we still wouldn't make progress. I would say, though, that we have to also keep in mind that even though our students might not look different visually, um, there are many differences that our students bring to the classroom that um, we can be mindful of. It, uh, in my role as associate professor, I get to meet all of the faculty candidates who are applying for positions across the university. And we made it a practice that I would talk to them to communicate the institution's commitment to diversity and to answer any questions they might have. And I was speaking with a candidate who was a, an applicant for an assistant professor position in our School of Business. And he talked about his experiences as a first generation student. And how one of the reasons he wanted to become a faculty member was because um, he wanted to be able to support other first generation students. And his concern about coming to the University of Denver was, again, this uh, reputation of rich white kids, that he wasn't going to have that opportunity. Um, and, and so we had a great conversation about that. What was interesting is I asked him if he had shared that with anyone else in the interview process. And that aspect of his identity, something that was really important to him, didn't come out, right? which I think would have been a rich asset to add to his candidacy. That allows me to, to do an interesting transition around identity. Uh, so we'll come back to challenges. But I want to move us to the part of the morning that is going to ask you to be a little vulnerable. And the question I'm thinking about is, are we what we teach? Are we what we teach? And it's this qu question about how we identify and how aspects of our identity 
inform the pedagogical decisions we make? It's a question I have. So are you what you teach? So I want you to think about what aspects of your identity are most important to you. By identity, I mean how you identify. Some obvious ones, gender, race, class, geographic region, hobbies, nationality. I want you to think about, to try to think about five aspects of your identity that are most important to you. I'm going to need you to write those down. Commit those to writing. You can change it later, but for now, I know it's unfair to limit it just to five, but I need you to pick. Make sure it's five. Yeah. Let's pick five. Everybody got five? No. no. <laughs> five is an arbitrary number. So take a look at the five that you've written. And then let me ask you another question. What aspects of your identity would your students perceive as important and related to who you are? same? Raise your hand if they're the same. Some, some overlap, but not completely the same. So we have a couple that are the same. So again, this question about how, if at all, do the important aspects of your identity inform the way that you teach. So I want you to, to do something. There's paper on your table. Need you to grab a blank piece of paper. And I need you to draw a big circle. A big circle on that piece of paper. And you are going to take those five aspects of your identity and put them into slices that are proportional to how important they are. So whatever is the most important will have the biggest slice. We call this our social identity pie. So list five. Draw it, slice in proportion to how important each of those aspects of your identity are to you. To you, not to your students, to you. One of them should be the most important aspect of your identity. And we would be able to tell that by it being the largest slice.
So next thing I need you to do is think about how that aspect of your identity that has the biggest slice might inform the way you approach teaching. How, if at all, might that aspect of your identity that's most important to you inform the way you approach teaching? Give that some thought. I'm going to ask you to take just a few minutes and share the answer to this last question. If we had more time, we would go through the whole pie and why you constructed it the way you did. But I just want you to focus on this last question. How, if at all, does that aspect of your identity that has the biggest slice approach the way you, or inform the way you approach teaching? So talk to the person you were talking to before about that particular question. <laughs> Again, I apologize to this ideal format you would have time to go through and share your beautiful drawings and <laughs> explain the rationale between the dotted lines and the wavy lines. And, uh, so, who wants to share what their biggest slice was? One person. Yes. I I want to just share this exercise. I don't know this guy. I've never met him. Uh -huh. And in both of these exercises, when we turn to each other and compare notes, they're almost identical. <laughs> <laughs> and so for both of us, it was kind of an enthusiasm. In this particular case, enthusiasm was a feature of ourselves that we identified affected our teaching style. Okay. But, but even beyond that, <laughs> it's... It's very, I'm amazed. I, I don't know, I wonder how many other people have had that experience here today. How many people had enthusiasm or something related to that in their slice? Raise your hands. Okay. Was the question how many other groups found That was another, his question, yes. How many people had similarities in there when you shared? Wow. <laughs> so, and say a little bit about how enthusiasm shapes the way you approach teaching. Pardon, no, Share a little bit about how enthusiasm... Well, I teach a course that I think a lot of students come into it and they don't know, uh, know they know very little about the subject coming in the door. So I, my, one of my biggest jobs is to... <coughs> share my enthusiasm for the subject with them in such a way that they'll want to not only learn what I have to teach them, but actually go out and look for more. Great, great. Another slice, yes. Um, I had a big slice was that I'm a, a spouse and a parent. Okay. And, and I, I'm a statistician also, I teach statistics. I, I also teach a men of color skills class. Okay. And I think that having, um, and I've always been very open about having kids and having that. And I actually have found it's put a lot of people at ease in my classes and even in the quantitative courses, the women, I think, maybe I hopefully the men relate more. And some of the students who come from uh, female dominated households are very comfortable with, mm -hmm. with the identity as a, as a parent and a spouse. Wow. How many of you have parent or spouse? Raise your hands. Thank you. Another one. Yes. Uh, I put down uh, engineer as one of my big identities, and I think of myself more as rapidly than being a professor. And with that, uh, I guess it's an expectation I have of our students to be able to figure it out, to be able to solve problems, you know, with study, with asking questions. Uh, and so they don't always get to that point, but that's what, we're, what I 
So how many of you had your sort of academic specialty in your pie? Okay. Anybody else have it as their biggest slice? Okay. Your specialty is the biggest. We all agree with that? Your specialty is your, should be your biggest slice. In the class. Parent was biggest for you. Yeah. Well, it will vary from individual to individual, right? Another slice. Yes? For me, it was uh, being an immigrant or not from this country. OK. But I'm not a part of the kind of the discipline that I teach. So it's a feeling of not really belonging to yeah. um, your area. So foreigner, immigrant. Yeah. And how does that inform your teaching? Um, yeah, I'm sort of interested, obviously, in language and translation and, and ways of mapping those kind of uh, what it means to talk about something that you don't speak from your own experience. Yeah. So it sort of runs against identity politics in a sense. Right. So, how many of you had being an immigrant in your pie? Split it in my pie. And did anyone else have it as their largest slice? Okay. Another one. I was say I had it as the son of an immigrant family. Okay. So, okay. Another slice. Yes. Gender. Gender. And how does gender inform the way you approach teaching? Well, I think for me, it's. Um, particularly at Cornell where we have a lack of equality in terms of gender. Um, looking at the folks that I'm working with, I always think about how do we bring more people into the profession, people of women who are women of color, who are <laughs> a variety of things. Right. Um, and then working with students, whether it be grad students or undergraduate students, thinking about that is what, what actually uh, informs other people's practice in the classroom and outside. How many of you have gender? Raise your hand. And if gender was your largest slice, slice keep your hands up, please. Okay. Good. I, I just wanted to point out, I think no men raised their hands. Let's do that again. Let's do that again. Raise your hand if you had gender in your slice. Oh, we did have a couple. Okay. Come. I'll Come. I'm actually raising it for this fellow. <laughs> but, but, point well taken, overwhelmingly, right, women. What do you all think about that? I mean, I think it's very similar to the idea about ethnicity, race, the rest. White people frequently don't identify or think their race or their cultural identity is important, but people of color, of different ethnicities, will almost always. So the white is regarded, well, everybody's white. How's that different, right? Um, I happen to be, my father was Tuscarora, so I am half Native American. And it is absolutely central to who I am, right? When people look at me, they see a white person. But I hang out with the American Indian Program, with with students of color, with native students, and they see me as, you know, native. You think that doesn't make me crazy? Yes. <laughs> and it absolutely defines my life about 60% of the time, um, regardless of where I am, right? So, and I know that white people, they don't have this problem, right? right. Um, and they don't think that white is a, an identity, but it is, right? I mean, it's as much an identity as Tuscarora is an identity, right? The same way is that women is as much an identity as male is, but that the men, particularly the white men, get to say, well, this is the normal, right? It's not really different from anybody else, right. but so I don't have to acknowledge it. I think there's something about institutional culture, particularly in an academy, but not exclusively, that has a way of normalizing certain aspects of our identity. And when you can align with whatever that dominant identity is, you're less likely to think about it because it becomes normal. Right? You said it so much more articulate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I want to add to what 
Jane says, because class was a big part of my pie. I, I think we may develop our identity around those issues that we have struggled with. Mm -hmm. So I think identity kind of connects with struggle. And, uh, and I've negotiated class a lot, still do, in my life. And it does inform what I teach, because essentially I teach uh, students from a perspective of being a citizen in the world, you know, and so that becomes a big part of that, as, as does gender and, 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 and sort of the social, the political. So, so it's who I am, it's also what I teach, but again, class was one of my big pieces in the same way that Native American identity was yours, because we, we struggle, we have struggled with that, so we identify ourselves as like How many of you had class, or you had class in your life? Okay. Couple more. Yes. I put down that my biggest part of my identity is being wasp. Okay. Hooray! <laughs> White, Anglo Saxon, Protestant, and male. And in my 60s, I couldn't get more more ordinary from, from the American culture. But I do think that's part of my identity. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm disrespecting others. It really does not. And I've made an effort to broaden my horizons and to see beyond my own background. I uh, also come from somewhat privileged and academic background. So I mean, I have all sorts of things that I accept without thinking about it. And uh, that's part of the reason I'm here, I guess. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Just I would just call it queerness, mm -hmm. queer sexuality, or whatever. And how does it inform your teaching? Um, well, well, it certainly does. Um, but again, I've mentioned a couple times in, in sociology, so we talk about these things. Yeah. That's our job. And <laughs> so um, basically. <laughs> I'm not to articulate this, but we do, um, we, we pay attention to um, human identity groups and we talk about them and we read uh, material about them and we encourage students to engage with them in ways that don't put them on the spot or that help them feel comfortable. And for instance, with LGBT stuff, there's a lot of stuff in the news, so we talk about that and what that means to people. And, you know, again, but a lot of it's just helping people feel safe, knowing that they can think about and talk about these things, and that they're nobody's a bad guy, and yeah. it's okay to, to process this. Yeah. So it seems that there is, a, in, in your particular case, an opportunity to align very important aspects of your identity with a certain intentionality around how you approach the design of your course. Yes, but I, I think it's really important to not, I, I think it's really important to not have my students feel like I'm putting anything about who I am on them, mm -hmm. but that I'm making room for everyone, and that I'm willing to <coughs> stand with a particular group or other, and I'm willing to have a certain amount of vulnerability, but, but that, again, I, you know, I kind of make it really clear that every, you know, every type of expression is important as long as it's respecting other human rights. I think that's kind of the bottom line. And that's the delicate balance that we often struggle with in terms of uh, particularly those of us who um, are more closely to what we teach, right? That we are able to create spaces that allow for not who we are to dominate but to serve as one example of engaging holistically in the learning environment. And so uh, one of the rules I try to um, keep is that I don't ask students to do anything I'm not prepared to do. And if I expect my students to be fully present in the learning environment, then I need to be fully present in the learning environment. And it didn't take me long when I got to the University of Denver to figure out that what I looked like was going to matter. Right? Not that not only matter for me, 
but matter for the students, for whom many of them, I was their first real live human interaction with an African American male. Right. So imagine what it's like to teach students who have never engaged someone like me in a position of authority in a classroom context. And that wasn't just the white students. There were African American students who I was their first African American <coughs> teacher. Talking about preschool, K-12, undergraduate education, a master's program for some. So how is that not going to matter in the teaching and learning context? And it became clear to me that I had to figure out how I was going to engage in teaching students who um, had all sorts of questions and ideas, whose understanding of what it meant to be black was based on what they saw on TV and read in magazines. So my approach to that was to be as transparent as possible about who I am and what matters to me. Because I found that by doing that, it relieves students from having to guess, to waste that unnecessary energy trying to figure out what does Frank care about? Why is he teaching these courses about diversity? How have my life experiences brought me to this place? Right? And I often say, whenever I go into the classroom, I give up a little piece of my soul. Right? And for me, that's a small price to pay in the pursuit of learning. I wish all my colleagues would enter the class as transparent as they can be about who they are and what they value. I want to sort of flip the script a little bit, and I'll talk about my pie real quickly, and I have to acknowledge that this has changed since the last time I was here. I was not an administrator, and it's slowly taking over my pie. <laughs> I have a problem with that. Um, transformative intellectual used to be a much larger slice. And it seems that the administrative slices are eroding that. Just need to think about that. East Coast is still a part of my slice. Um, I, in this month alone, I will have been from Boston to Denver three times. And it just happens I'm a, a New England Patriots for now. <laughs> and the last time I stayed in Denver and watched the Patriots, they lost in a Super Bowl. So I promise not to do that again. But it didn't take me long to figure out that I couldn't use East Coast examples in Denver, especially my Bronco fans. So that, so that was a quick realization. I had to change the examples that I used. My parents are from the Caribbean. I was actually born in London, England. Uh, came to the U.S. in search of the American dream, like many of you, um, and grew up in Boston during racially charged time of busing. Um, and I have lived experiences of being escorted by the police into South Boston High School to play basketball and being escorted out by the police who were protecting us from the neighbors who didn't want us to be there. I have lived examples of leaving school and running to my side of the neighborhood and turning around only to chase the students who were chasing us back to their side of the neighborhood. So race is something that early on was a new identity for me. My parents, being from the Caribbean, were used to being around black folks all the time. 
and they didn't really understand what I was going through as a student because that wasn't their lived experience. They have a much better understanding of it now. They, um, I think, did a really good job in trying to protect us from the sort of hostilities of uh, growing up in a racialized um, environment. But race became to be a central component of my identity. It went from something that was imposed on me to something I embraced. I still have those moments where every now and then I think about what it would be like to not have to think about that part of my identity. When I got to the University of Denver, I would go to work for weeks at a time and not see another black male. And I often wondered what my colleagues would feel like if they could go to work and not see someone who looked like them, not see someone that they could identify with on a regular basis. So for me, race has always been the most salient aspect of my identity. And it absolutely informed what I do professionally, personally. Um, and I realized that because that is an important aspect of my identity, I need to be intentional, intentional about creating communities of learning, not only for my students, but for me. Right? That Creating a trusting learning environment serves not only our students who have different experiences and backgrounds, but they can also serve us as instructors, particularly those of us who are not part of the dominant groups that occupy our campus. As a student, and this is where I want to sort of flip the script for a second, and focus on student experiences. I was always conscious of who was teaching the classroom, and whether or not that person looked like me. And through some research, it was sort of confirmed for me that I was not alone in that, that actually students who have highly sort of racialized concepts of self, so meaning that race is a salient part of their identity, look at the spaces they enter through a racialized lens. And what that means for some, not all, that when they enter the classroom, and in this case, the instructor is white, you as the instructor are guilty until proven innocent. Without having any interaction with you previously, their prior experiences inform how they view you without having any interaction whatsoever with you. And I would argue that that's the case for all our students. I heard a lecture last week where, and this is not my field, but the, the faculty member was talking about this notion of affected legacies. And basically, and this is my short interpretation of it, that we bring memories and experiences with us that guide how we engage. And so for me, my prior experiences with white instructors who never took the time to get to know me on an individual basis shaped how I looked at my new instructors. And that instructor had a few moments to figure out or to either confirm or contest my perceptions of them. Right? And based on that, I um, would determine how I'm going to engage in that space. It's a matter of engaging from a defensive perspective or a self-preservation perspective or engaging freely to learn. 
Students make those choices all the time based on what we do. So it's not fair. This space, this university has a history that every time someone new enters, they encounter it. In our role, I argue, is to disrupt those perceptions, those legacies that both we inherit and that we create. Right. So how do we do that? Well, let me sum up this part, right? So there is these sort of salient characteristics that we identify, and you all listed five of them. I'm absolutely sure there are more than just five. There are also these characteristics that others perceive as salient to us. I would argue in an ideal world, the gap between those two are less and less, right? <coughs> that students get to see who we really are in our engagement of teaching. And that we don't hide behind the content that we're trying to get them to engage. Because they're intersecting in the learning environment. Our perceptions of ourselves and others' perceptions of us. Obviously, identity can complicate the teaching and learning environment. Right? And I'll go back to the word gaps. There are these gaps between how students perceive us and how we perceive ourselves. There are gaps between how we perceive our students and how they perceive themselves. And we need to close the gap in order to create optimal teaching and learning environments. Particularly around race, one of the challenges is teaching students with different levels of identity. My life experiences have made race very salient for me. You could have another person who looks exactly like me with different life experience for whom race is not the most salient aspect of their identity. How do we figure that out, right? The challenge is you gotta figure it out because it's gonna inform what kind of decisions you make regarding that student. You're not gonna ask a student, or you shouldn't ask a student who looks like me but doesn't identify with race strongly to talk about what it's like to be black in America. Right? And in theory, unless I have given you some sense that this is important to me and I'm willing to share it. We have to be sensitive and nuanced in terms of how we extract that from me. We have to figure out how to do that in ways that doesn't sort of isolate me or further marginalize me in the space. The more you get to know your students, the more they're going to trust that the, the pedagogical decisions you are making are about them and not about some perception you have of them. Right. Balancing the needs of majority and minority students. I use minority, I don't like to use that term, but I use it here for <coughs> its uh, ease. But we have, not only do we have students who individually identify in different ways, we have students who belong to different groups. And there are dominant groups and subdominant groups within our campuses. Avoiding stereotypes and generalizations, there are academic stereotypes. The student can't write. Actually, a student told me that a professor said to him, your writing is weak. But don't be concerned about that. Most people from your community have that problem. Okay. Behavioral stereotype, <coughs> classic one is white men can't jump, white people can't dance. Behavioral stereotype. 
There is a growing body of research, and many of you are probably aware of uh, Claude Steele's work on stereotype threat, around how our sense of self and how we think others perceive us in a particular environment around a particular skill can impact the way we perform that skill. How do we engage students as individuals and not as native informants? And creating, I have safe here, but I'm troubled with the notion of safe. I forgot to change that to affirming. Hmm. How do we create identity affirming learning environments? Learning environments that affirm aspects of my identity that are important to me and don't ask me to leave those at the door. How does it affirm aspects of my identity that could serve as a bridge to understanding important com complex concepts and issues? For the sake of time, I think I've touched on some of these, so I will. <coughs> get through these. So for the last point here, and I think I've touched on this a little bit, there are choices that students make in your classroom. There are academic choices that students make in your classroom based on their perception of how safe the learning environment is. Right. So, the example of my student choosing not to come to class because they thought the professor was going, not thought, they knew the professor was going to um, put them on the spot. Or decisions about what to disclose in a, in a, a reflective essay. Or the over sort of um, thinking of answers in an effort to try to figure out exactly what it is that you want them to do so that they don't become associated. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.